moving clocks slow down. There's no fact of the matter about whether or not two events happen at the same time. It seems like it's about time to rethink what we mean by time. In this video, we'll discuss the philosophical implications of special relativity for time. Hello folks and welcome back. I'm Brian Roberts. Special relativity implies that a few obvious changes are needed in how we understand time. In the first place, a few concepts that we thought were objective and absolute turn out to not be. For example, how much time has passed since you started watching this video? It turns out the answer depends on which reference frame you choose. So what can we say about time in summary? If there's one thing that people love to say about special relativity, it's that time is the fourth dimension or that space and time are part of one and the same thing. But what do people mean when they say that? Remember, special relativity consists in the relativity principle and the light postulate. We use it to derive things like time dilation, length contraction, and the relativity of simultaneity. And we used space times as an easy way to visualize them. But when did it happen that we dramatically introduced time as the fourth dimension? The answer is we didn't. There is a sense in which this is true. If I want to identify an event, like a first kiss, in a given reference frame, like the Earth, I can identify the first kiss by giving you three coordinates of space, longitude, latitude, and altitude above the Earth, and one coordinate of time, like the time it happened according to clocks on Earth. It takes four independent numbers, or four dimensions, to describe this event. There's nothing mind-blowing about that. It's just ordinary space together with the notion of a timeline. Einstein did not invent the notion of a timeline. So yes, it's true that there's some sense in which time is the fourth dimension, but it's a little trivial. And it's certainly not correct to say that time and space are one and the same thing. They're not. You can see that immediately by just thinking about the nature of a light cone. A light cone consists in a future light cone and a past light cone. There isn't a spatial cone. Lines that thread through the light cone are possible sequences of events for an observer to experience. Lines that go outside the light cone are not, they're space-like. So time and space are not the same thing. Not in relativity theory, not at all. And yet people keep saying it. But this is one of those things in popular media that even Einstein thought he'd better try and correct. Einstein wrote, first, a remark concerning the relation of the theory to four-dimensional space. It is a widespread error that the special theory of relativity is supposed to have, to a certain extent, first discovered, or at any rate, newly introduced, the four-dimensionality of the physical continuum. This, of course, is not the case. Classical mechanics, too, is based on the four-dimensional continuum of space and time. Even according to Einstein, space and time are not the same thing. Of course, a set of events that happen at the same time is subtle in special relativity. That set is called a hypersurface of simultaneity. And we've seen how different moving observers will disagree about which set of events are a hypersurface of simultaneity. So there is something strange and new about the nature of time and special relativity. Not that time and space are part of one and the same thing, but that concepts like the present no longer have the same objective meaning. The present is supposed to be a set of events that happen at the same time, now. So the present is a special hypersurface of simultaneity. But to identify the present, which observer do we choose? This is a more profound challenge from special relativity. One of the most pervasive human experiences is that time is passing, and most of us would say we're passing from the past to the present to the future. Cambridge philosopher John McTaggart even suggested that one of the basic facts about time is the ordering of past, present, and future. And there's a common bit of wisdom about the present, which is that it's what's real about time. The past is gone, it's not real anymore. And the future hasn't happened yet, so it's not real either. The philosophical view called presentism says that only the present is real. The past and the future are not. In contrast, eternalism says that the past, present, and future are all equally real. On that view, the present has no special status as far as reality goes. So here are two philosophical positions, presentism and eternalism. What does special relativity imply about this debate? Well, you can see from the very start that presentism has a hard task ahead. How are we supposed to identify the present? One observer will say one hypersurface is the present. Another observer will say a different one is. So it looks like presentism isn't so well defined. This worry was made into a serious challenge for presentism 
by C.W. Rietdeck and Hilary Putnam. The Rietdeck Putnam argument concludes that presentism is false. First, ask the presentist to identify any two events that they think are real, say, a first kiss in London and a first kiss in Paris. We'll place the London event on the left and the Paris event on the right. Those events are on the same hypersurface of simultaneity for some observer. Let's call it the rest observer. But now consider an observer moving from Paris towards London. The hypersurface of simultaneity for that observer will be tilted up and to the left. And if events on that hypersurface of simultaneity are equally real, then that entire hypersurface consists in real events. We said the first kiss in Paris is real, so everything on this hypersurface is real as well. That means there's an event to the future of the first kiss in London, which is real. There is no hypersurface of simultaneity that contains both of those two events. They're related by a time-like line. So it seems it's not just the present that's real. Even if we take that first kiss in London to be real because it's in the present, we'll still find some event to the future of that first kiss, which is also real. In fact, you can keep repeating this argument through clever choices of observers and hypersurfaces and argue that the entire space-time is real. And so the argument goes, presentism is false and eternalism is true. Of course, there are a number of assumptions that go into making this argument work. We assumed, for example, that events on the same hypersurface of simultaneity for any observer are equally real. And maybe there's a way around this, which I'll leave to you. But the argument at least shows that in special relativity, defining what we mean by the present is not so easy. And even worse, there's a danger that it's completely incoherent. We might give up the concept of the present completely. Maybe we could even do without the notion of simultaneity. After all, Causes and effects seem to propagate along time-like curves and light-like curves. Causes and effects don't propagate along space-like curves. Some, such as the philosopher Hans Reichenbach, have even suggested that that's all we need to describe time. The passage of time is nothing more than the propagation of a causal process along time-like lines or light-like lines. That theory is called the causal theory of time. Philosophers have said a lot about the causal theory of time, and physicists have even used it to construct new theories, such as the causal sets approach to quantum gravity. The difficulty with the causal theory of time is knowing what we mean by causes and effects. We certainly use causal language all the time, but it's not always clear what exactly we mean by that. The great philosopher Bertrand Russell even said, the law of causality, I believe, like much that passes muster among philosophers, is a relic of a bygone age, surviving like the monarchy only because it is erroneously supposed to do no harm. With all due respect to Her Majesty, causation might do more harm than good. One of the reasons philosophy is so important in the analysis of science is in clarifying what the implications of that science are. So when somebody in the media or even a scientist says something vague about the nature of time and special relativity, now you know how to sharpen those ideas. Newton, Einstein, and many other physicists are steeped in philosophy as a way of clarifying their thinking. There's a lot more clarifying to do, but we'll save some of that for next time. Thanks, folks. Stay safe. We'll see you next time.